Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia, and this is a continuation of uh, a reading of a treatise by Clement of Alexandria titled, Who is the Rich Man That Shall Be Saved? It is uh, Clement's exposition of the account of the rich uh, young ruler who came to Christ as recorded in Mark chapter 10. And so we'll uh, resume here with chapter 6. For our Lord and Savior was asked pleasantly a question most appropriate for him, the life respecting life, the Savior respecting salvation, the teacher respecting the chief doctrines taught, the truth respecting the true immortality, the word respecting the word of the Father, the perfect respecting the perfect rest, the immortal respecting the sure immortality. He was asked respecting those things on account of which he descended, which he inculcates, which he teaches, which he offers, in order to show the essence of the gospel, that is, the gift of eternal life. For he foresaw as God both what he would be asked and what each one would answer him. For who should do this more than the prophet of the prophets and the Lord of every prophetic spirit? And having been called good and taking the starting note from this first expression, he commences his teaching with this, turning the pupil to God, the good, and first and only dispenser of eternal life, which the Son who received it of him, gives to us. Chapter 7. Wherefore, the greatest and chiefest point of the instructions which relate to life must be implanted in the soul from the beginning, to know the eternal God, the giver of what is eternal, and by knowledge and comprehension to possess God, who is first and highest and one and good. For this is the immutable and immovable source and support of life, the knowledge of God who really is and who bestows the things which really are, that is, those which are eternal, from whom both being and the continuance of it are derived to other beings. For ignorance of him is death, but the knowledge and appropriation of him and love and likeness to him are the only life. Chapter 8. He then, who would live the true life, is enjoined first to know him, whom no one knows except the Son reveal him. Next is to be learned the greatness of the Savior after him and the newness of grace. For, according to the apostle, the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And the gifts granted through a faithful servant are not equal to those bestowed by the true Son, if then the law of Moses had been sufficient to confer eternal life, it were to no purpose for the Savior himself to come and suffer for us, accomplishing the course of human life from his birth to his cross, and to no purpose for him who had done all the commandments of the law from his youth to fall on his knees and beg from another immortality. For he had not only fulfilled the law, but had begun to do so from his very earliest youth. For what is there great or preeminently illustrious in an old age which is unproductive of faults? But if one is juvenile, frolicsome, and the fire of youth shows a mature judgment older than his years, this is a champion admirable and distinguished and hoary preeminently in mind. But nevertheless, this man being such is perfectly persuaded that nothing is wanting to him as far as respects righteousness, but that he is entirely destitute of life. Wherefore, he asks it from him who alone is able to give it. And with reference to the law, he carries confidence, but the Son of God he addresses in supplication. He is transferred from faith to faith as perilously tossing and occupying a dangerous anchorage in the law, he makes for the Savior to find a haven. Chapter 9. Jesus, accordingly, does not charge him with not having fulfilled all things out of the law, but loves him, 
and fondly welcomes his obedience in what he had learned, but says that he is not perfect as respects eternal life, inasmuch as he had not fulfilled what is perfect, and that he is a doer indeed of the law, but idle at the true life. Those things indeed are good, who denies it? For the commandment is holy, as far as a sort of training with fear and preparatory discipline goes, leading as it did to the culmination of legislation and to grace. But Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, and not as a slave making slaves, but sons and brethren and fellow heirs who perform the Father's will. Chapter 10. If thou wilt be perfect. Consequently, he was not yet perfect, for nothing is more perfect than what is perfect. And divinely the expression, if thou wilt, showed the self-determination of the soul holding converse with him. For choice depended on the man as being free, but the gift on God as the Lord. And he gives to those who are willing and are exceedingly earnest and ask that so their salvation may become their own. For God compels not, for compulsion is repugnant to God, but supplies to those who seek and bestows on those who ask and opens to those who knock. If thou wilt then, if thou really willest and art not deceiving thyself, acquire what thou lackest. One thing is lacking thee, the one thing which abides, the good, that which is now above the law, which the law gives not, which the law contains not, which is the prerogative of those who live. He, forsooth, who had fulfilled all the demands of the law from his youth and had glory in what was magnificent, was not able to complete the whole with this one thing which was specially required by the Savior, so as to receive the eternal life which he desired. But he departed displeased, vexed at the commandment of the life, on account of which he supplicated. For he did not truly wish life, as he averred, but aimed at the mere reputation of the good choice. And he was capable of busying himself about many things. But the one thing, the work of life, he was powerless and disinclined and unable to accomplish. Such also was what the Lord said to Martha, who was occupied with many things and distracted and troubled with serving, while she blamed her sister because leaving serving, she set herself at his feet, devoting her time to learning. Thou art not troubled about many things, but Mary hath chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So also he bade him leave his busy life, and cleave to one, and adhere to the grace of him who offered everlasting life. Here ends chapter 10, and here ends the second of eight episodes, as we have read chapters 6 through 10. And this will bring, again, this episode to a conclusion. I'll look forward to continuing this in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.